everyone, welcome to Everyday Champions Live. My name is Beck, and we are a global family online serving local people in the name of Jesus. And we are so pleased that you have joined in with us today. Whether you're in one of our rooms, give us a shout if you're in one of the rooms. Yeah, I can't hear you, but I'm sure you're shouting. And if you're online and you're watching from home or somewhere across the world, or maybe you're watching this back, Give us some shout in the emoji with some emojis in the chat. We want to hear from you. We are so pleased that you've joined with us today. And it's going to be great. It's great to meet together as family, to be encouraged, to share together, and to be discipled together. So this is going to be a great time together. And we've got Gareth Morgan coming up shortly, who's going to continue our conversation. And it's quite a significant message today, a great message. So I encourage you to be ready to receive from that. But just before, to remind you that we have now broken up for the summer of, from our circles. I know, uh, we, who loved the last four, quick four part series that we just had in circles on being devoted? It has been an amazing uh, set of uh, teaching from Leanne. Thank you to Leanne Morgan, our senior leader who kind of delivered that, uh, those sessions. They were brilliant. And that last session was all about being devoted to the breaking of bread. And we learned so much about that. And if you haven't caught up on that se session, I am telling you, you need to catch up on it. It is a, a significant session, uh, but it was just full of great teaching. I learned tons of stuff. So we are about going to be meeting people, catching up with people, being intentional about meeting people to have food together, meeting people for a coffee. This is your summer to get organising. Don't wait for other people to sort it out. You initiate those things. And we're excited to meet together as family across our locations and across the globe. So make sure that you have caught up on that last session and that you start to put some of those things into action. It was a great session. But yes, we have broken up for the summer and more information about the circles that will be coming in September will be dropping into your inbox, will be on the broadcast. So make sure you stay tuned and make sure you are subscribed to our emails. There are a few sneaky people out there that have unsubscribed. Well, you're not gonna find out. You need to make sure you're subscribed. And if you're new here and you're not subscribed to our emails or joining uh, in on our email list, you can get in touch with us at hello at everydaychampion.org.uk. And if you're in one of our rooms, there'll be some cards around where you can fill in your details and we can get you on that list. Well, let's crack on with the rest of our gathering. Gareth is going to be bringing uh, the next instalment of our series and uh, it's going to be great. So make sure you've got notes, uh, pens, devices, papers to take some notes. It's going to be great. Well, welcome to another conversation where we are unpacking what it takes to go from being a misfit to being mission fit. If you want to catch up on what we've been looking at so far, you of course can go back and watch on our YouTube channel and catch up on the sessions. And we are going to really look today at something I think is so important. And yet, I've got to be honest, something that I have found quite difficult in my life. And so I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. But by way of introduction, let me share with you something that happened fairly recently. In our centre in Newark, we got a water bill that came through. And those that opened the bill in the office, their mouths dropped. Because this water bill was for thousands. Now, water can be expensive, especially when you use a lot of it. But usually, our bills at the centre in Newark, would be typically under 100, if not just over 100, depending on usage. But in this instance, it was thousands. And we all just looked at it and thought, what on earth has created this bill? We thought, this has got to be a mistake. So Rebecca it was who got onto it and started to phone up and say, hey, there must be a mistake. There's no way in a million years that we have used this amount of water. I mean, there would have to be you know, revival across the nation and for everybody to be baptised in Newark 
for us to use that amount of water. I mean, we're talking multiple swimming pools worth of water that would need to be used in order to result in that cost that we had on this bill. So what had to happen then was there had to be a period of time where we would measure whether, first of all, the meter was faulty, which of course is one of the the theories, and maybe it's a faulty meter, and therefore that's why it's giving you a faulty reading. And then we had to prove our usage. And so Rebecca, along with others that would help, would go every single day and would have to lift the manhole and to, or manhole cover, not the manhole, but, and start to measure by taking a picture of the meter and to see where we were at. And of course, it was proven that we didn't use that amount of water. But we needed to prove it using facts. We could say, well, we don't feel we use that amount of water. And of course, that's uh, an understatement. I mean, that's a huge amount of water. But of course, the people on the other end of the, the phone are, they don't know our situation. They, for all we know, we could be, you know, having a whole big jacuzzi party. <laughs> I mean, that sounds fun, doesn't it? Yeah, everyone uh, down to Newark and we'll have uh, hundreds of jacuzzis, fill them up and have an amazing party. Uh, but no, it wasn't, it wasn't the fact that, you know, we could just say to them, this isn't what happened. We've not used that amount of water. We couldn't just take our feeling of feeling kind of, oh my word, this is wrong. How dare you? We had to prove it. We had to measure And we had to track what was real. Because if we could track what was real, then we could prove to the water company that this is the correct measurement. It's amazing, isn't it? Because that's what measurement does. Measurement helps us to separate feelings from facts. We felt there's no way in a million years we've used this amount of water. But we had to go to facts. Feelings weren't good enough. One thing that we've had in the last year as a couple, me and Leanne, because like all good married couples, we have lively debates <laughs> slash arguments. Um, no, lively debates, passionate debates. It's good to have passionate debates. And so one of our passionate debates would be around the area of who is the best driver. I mean, a little competition is always good to keep the spice in a relationship. <laughs> and so uh, there's always been a healthy dose of com- competition in our marriage. In fact, even before we were married, I may have shared this before, but I remember on, I think this was in the early months of us being together and kind of courting, as it was called, courting. That's not playing tennis. That's kind of having a girlfriend or a boyfriend. And uh, <laughs> we, we were in our relationship and uh, I think Leanne came round to our house and and my parents' house. And we were up till gone midnight playing Scrabble. And Leanne was convinced that she had won. And I was just like, no, I'm I'm going to, I've got a word here and it's going to it's going to absolutely turn this result on its head and she was sick of waiting and so she lifted up the scrabble board in in righteous anger you know like Jesus turning the tables <laughs> Leanne turned the scrabble board and the letters went everywhere so of course we had a uh, we, we had an interesting uh, conversation <laughs> and uh, but of course there's healthy competition and one of those competitions as I said was Who's the best driver? Well, our insurance company that we went with in this past year, they sent through a device. Now, you may have this kind of device. And this device is a Bluetooth device, and it goes in the car that's insured, and it measures. It tracks whether you've been keeping to the speed limit, whether you have been you know, focused, and you're not being kind of messing around with your phone or with you know, whatever is on the dashboard, it, it measures whether you're taking corners too, too tightly and quickly or whether you are braking too suddenly. And so it, it literally kind of gives you a daily report and you can get cash back on your insurance it, 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 by way of kind of a, an incentive to drive better. So, of course, you know, I would regularly be looking at this and and looking for evidence to prove what I've always known, that Leanne is a better driver. 
So you, you can feel something. You can feel, well, I feel that I'm better, or I feel that I'm doing well. I feel that I'm not that bad, or I feel that I'm getting better, stronger, going faster, that I can, I can do this, or I can take on this next challenge. But of course, feelings are, well, they can't always be trusted. They can be misleading. Whereas measuring facts can really help to establish truth. So here's an interaction, okay? Interaction number one for everyone that is watching this. And if you're watching with someone, then of course you can discuss this with those that you're watching with, whether that's in one of our rooms or whether you're watching on the YouTube channel. And of course, if you're watching back, you of course can just simply reflect and ask yourself this question. You know, what have you been measuring recently? What have you been measuring recently? So that might be at work. There may be a measurement that you have to use at work. And this measurement is the thing that everybody always talks about. You know, we must measure this or you, know, you must keep an eye on that. So what have you been measuring and, and why do you measure that? Okay, so you can share that with those that you're watching with. Or it could be personally at home, you're, you're measuring something like us. Maybe it's something new, like measuring how you're driving. And it's a, it's a new type of measurement. And, and why is that interesting? Or why is it helpful? Or why has it led to lively debates? <laughs> okay, so what have you been measuring recently? And why? A few minutes on this, and then we'll be back.
brilliant. I love the fact that in these conversations, we get to learn so much more about those that are around us. Maybe people that are around us that we're, we always spend time with, but we're learning new things. Or whether it's people that you're, you're meeting for the first time. It's interesting, isn't it, how important a role measurement plays. In some roles in life, it can quite literally be the difference between life or death, especially in healthcare, of course, where those measurements are so important. They are vital in order to give information to those who are caring for us and do a fantastic job in our health service, in, in kind of making critical decisions sometimes. But they need the facts. They they can't just say, well, how do you feel? Of course, that is something to ask, but but they need to know more than just feelings. They need to know the facts. And, and so there are lots of different measurements in life, personally and professionally. In fact, I've heard that there are three types of people in the world, those who can count and those who can't. Some of you are catching on to that. <laughs> In fact, you know, it's like I said, measuring things is a matter of life or death sometimes. I mean, I've been measuring recently, you know, the, the, in our neighborhood, the same bike, the same bike tries to run me down every day. It's a vicious cycle. Vicious cycle. Bike running me down every day. Vicious cycle. Well, you may say that, Gareth, your dad jokes are a vicious cycle. They come around every week. Yep, and they're going to keep on coming, people. Who is happy about that? Awkward silence. <laughs> but, of course, measurement is key. And I want to go to Romans 15 because that's where we have been in the last few weeks as we've been looking at how do we go from being a misfit, somebody who feels unique but in a negative way sometimes that we don't fit in that we can't contribute that there is there's there's nothing that we can really affect or impact in this world and of course that is not the truth that's how we feel at times i felt that multiple times in my life but the truth is that our uniqueness sets us up for a unique mission and so we've got to go on a journey of understanding what that mission is we talked about that what the mindset is that we are to have, because like I've said, if we just focus on the fact that we are different, it can lead to a losing mindset. You know, I, I don't fit in. I don't have something to contribute. I'm worthless. And we spiral out of control in our internal conversation. But then, of course, measurement. How we need to measure key parts of this journey of life personally, professionally, spiritually, missionally, in order for us to bring the best of who we are in Christ and to serve to our highest and best capacity. Because ultimately, that's what we want to do. We are in his kingdom for such a time as this. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are in this kingdom for such a time as this. You absolutely better believe that. So we have got to take this serious. Life is not a dress rehearsal. This is it. We are to make an impact. We are part of his great commission, but there is a unique part for you to play. And there's a unique part for me to play. And of course, discipleship is being made ready to play that part so that we can uh, bring Christ into the space that he has called us to impact and influence and to deliver what he has placed inside of us. Well, the Apostle Paul in Romans 15 talks about in the second part of this chapter in this letter to the church at Rome, he talks about um, a, a contribution and an offering that was being prepared and taken up by the church at Rome. Now, this is something that Paul often talked about. Paul's job as a father and a founder, the apostle, was to, to recognize that, that the church existed so that there was interdependence. In other words, that every member of the church was there to play a contributing role to other members. It wasn't every man for themselves or every woman or child for themselves. It was the fact that we are a body. We are unique in part but actually, our significance is in the whole. And so, 
part of the role that Paul played was he would encourage and challenge churches to to prepare material gifts, financial gifts that would help other parts of the body of Christ, other churches, other people groups within the church that were struggling. And so let's read this, uh, these few verses, and then we're going to jump to another letter of his as we unpack this whole subject. So Paul says, For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. So after I have completed this task, I have made sure that they have received this contribution, and I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. So Paul here is talking about the contribution that the church is preparing and the the fact that this was a responsibility upon the, the, the church at Rome because they were Gentiles and what he's saying is is that the gospel that you've received, the gospel of the kingdom, of course, it started with, with the, the, the Jewish people because they were God's people and are God's people in the Old Testament. But of course, now in the New Testament, under the New Covenant, um, everybody has access to be, be a child of God in his kingdom. And so we have benefited, Paul says, by their spiritual blessings because it's come through them. And so now we have to make sure that we share with them our material blessings. Okay, so, so Paul is encouraging an abundance and an abundant mentality in the church rather than a scarcity mentality. And it's so easy, isn't it, to be, become a scarcity, uh, uh, have a scarcity mindset and to think in a way that I, I don't have enough and therefore I can't give. And, and, and that can really impact. In fact, it's huge, has a huge detrimental impact on our mission when we have that mindset. And so Paul here is, is challenging the church. He's saying, I know when I come to you, I'm going to come with the full measure of the blessing of Christ. And, and Paul here is, is indicating to the church that, you know, the way that we approach these things of being servants and giving and having this abundance mentality it affects everybody. You know, I've been in, uh, in meetings, in, in gatherings of, of believers when you know that people have brought an offering of, uh, of faith. In other words, maybe it's been a special offering and, and you know that, that people have thought about it and they've prepared it because there's an atmosphere of faith and that, that produces an atmosphere of health. I've also been in environments when that has not been the case. And, and it's almost like the measure of health is linked to the measure of faith. And so Paul here is, is in the Church of Rome indicating this importance of, of sharing the material blessings because, of course, they've experienced the, the blessing of spiritual blessing. But we're going to jump to 2 Corinthians 9 because, again, this is another letter to a church in Corinth, another a Gentile group, because that was Paul's specific assignment and mission. And Paul here gives us our first point that I want to bring out, and that is measurement is good management. Let's say that together. Measurement is good management. Let me go back to my illustration of the the car. And, and it's interesting because we just recently had it in for a service. And some of the, 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 the challenges with the, the health of the car, you can link to the performance of some of those metrics that we've seen in the year. Now, of course, cars, uh, they deteriorate naturally. And so not everything is, is as a result, direct result of what you've done, but of course, of just wear and tear. But it's interesting that, that actually you can prevent things happening to your car by learning from the, the things that it's shown. You know, this is how you've been driving. This is, you know, if, if for instance, if you've been stopping too uh, quickly and, and kind of setting off too quickly and you've kind of got that stop-start kind of way of driving, I'm sure none of you have got that. <laughs> then, of course, one of the things that's going to go is your brake pads are going to go sooner because, you know, the constant braking. 
So again, you know, if you want to be a good manager and steward of your car, then measurement is really important. I mean, how many of us have forgotten to check the oil? Come on, raise your hand right now. Okay, if you're watching this in the on YouTube, just put a, a person with a hand up or just stick an emoji down or whatever. You know, you've forgotten to to check the oil. Yeah, and, and how did that end? I guess it depends how long you left it without the oil, doesn't it? But again, like m- measurement is good management. So Paul here says in 2 Corinthians 9 from verse 5 to 6, and again, I encourage you to read the whole chapter in your own time to get the full context, but Paul says this, So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Some really interesting points that we could draw out of this, because Paul here is highlighting the connection between measuring and preparation. So Paul's saying, you know, I'm going to come to you in advance, and I'm going to come to you in advance because then we can find out exactly where you're at with preparing this gift, and then that will help us to measure how much more needs to happen so that we can finish well, so that we can prepare well. And, and Paul is highlighting that you know, the, the measurement and the preparation of these arrangements is linked to the spirit of how that gift is given. Because he says, you know, ultimately, and let me like, paraphrase the, 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 the reverse of what he's saying. He's saying, if we don't prepare... And if we don't measure how well we're currently doing and therefore what is left to do, what's going to happen is it's going to be a gift that's given out of reaction rather than preparation. And it's going to be done out of fear rather than faith because you haven't prepared well. Because if you're not preparing well in what you're giving, then you're probably not preparing well in other areas that you're stewarding. Because measuring is a mindset because it's a mindset of of excellence it's a mindset a management mindset is one in which we recognize that the details matter that the details reflect what we truly value and so paul here is saying i don't want to deliver an offering that is grudgingly given because ultimately, don't forget, Paul's the one that's going to deliver it. And he doesn't want to turn up and say, hey, guys, yeah, the guys at Corinth, they, they, they took this, this offering, but mm, that's it. I'll, I'll just leave that with you. And he wanted to make sure that, again, he came. As he said to the church at Rome, I come in full blessing. In other words, that we've done this well and, and with excellence. You see, we lose the joy of something when we, we haven't managed that area of our life well. Any area of your life right now that lacks joy can often be traced to mismanagement. I know that in my own life. I know that when I have not managed my time well, and therefore I've not managed spending enough time with Leanne or enough time with the the kids or enough time um, with, with friends or enough time with, with colleagues or enough time, whatever that is, that area will lack joy. It will la- therefore lack fruit. It will therefore lack health. And, and that's what we've got to understand here because measurement, measurement reveals health or lack of health. And on this journey of going from being a misfit to mission fit, it's a bit like, I guess, it's, is it from, uh, from couch to 5K, I think they call it. It's kind of talking about going from an extreme kind of place of lacking health, as in being unfit, to kind of being fit. For us to, to go on that journey, we, we've got to embrace measuring. We've got to measure. So it, usually what happens is an area where we lack joy is an area that we've mismanaged. But let me say this, let's, let's peel back a little bit more. So if a, an area where we lack joy is an area where we've mismanaged, if we peel that back again, where we've mismanaged is usually where we've 
mistrusted. In other words, we've placed our trust in the wrong things. And usually where we've placed our trust in the wrong things, there's fear. We've said it before, we'll say it again. But where I fear the most is where I trust God the least. So you can see here that measurements reveal what is really going on. And you may say, oh, well, I'm, I don't, do I really need to bother with measurement? Well, it doesn't sound an urgent activity, but it is linked to everything that is currently urgent in your life that you are having to deal with. So interaction number two, are you ready? What do you dislike measuring the most? Okay, let's be brutally honest. What do you dislike measuring the most? It might be dislike measuring your finances or measuring your health or measuring your fitness or, or measuring kind of how many books you've read or measuring you know, how, you know, your, your social life or measuring how you're impacting people for Christ or, you know, what, I can list 101 different things, but which do you dislike measuring the most? Like if I, if I were to say, right now we are going to measure this part of your life, what would you, what would you fear the most about measuring that? Okay, so what do you dislike measuring the most and what fear does it reveal? Okay, off you go.
Well done, those of you who are being brutally honest about what you least like to measure because of what you fear the most. You know, it's only when we get brutally honest about those areas that we really start to touch on the areas, not only that very often have the greatest pain, but also on the flip side have the greatest potential. We can live the rest of our lives avoiding that area. But if you avoid that area of pain, you avoid the area with the greatest purpose. If we avoid the area where we, 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 we struggle to face up to what's going on, then we become like the children of Israel who, who could have made it to the promised land in 11 days, but took 40 years. In fact, a whole generation missed the promise of God because they avoided dealing with the real issue. And I don't want you to wander anymore. I want you to occupy the space that God has for you. But if you are going to occupy the space God has for you, he needs to occupy the space in you, which means defeating some of these, these areas that we're avoiding okay, in our lives. So well done if you're being brutally honest. If maybe you've not quite got there yet, then I encourage you, let's do this. Okay, So good management. The second point is this. If, if measurement reveals good management, then good management reveals a trustworthy manager. Good management reveals a trustworthy manager. You know, good management is when somebody follows through on what they've been asked or challenged to do, and they do it with diligence, and they do it because they recognize that not only is this a good thing to do, but it's the, the thing that we have to do. It's recognizing that we all have to submit to a higher authority, and ultimately, we're one day going to have to give an account for what we've been given. You know, God hasn't just given us this potential and said, well, you know, just go live your life and enjoy it. No, we are stewards. We're to steward what he's given to us, the potential, the resource, the, the, the unique uh, skills and giftings and, and resources that he's put inside of us and given to us. And so um, in a moment, I'm just going to connect this to a parable that Jesus talked about, and it's a well-known parable. But let me just say this, because I think it's really important to highlight where we see this, to really honor people. You know, my father-in-law, you know, he's been a, a, a leader in a church for, well, many, many years. I don't want to guess how many decades, but multiple decades. I know at least uh, 35 years plus. Um, but he, he now, in the era of his life, this kind of uh, 70 plus years of, of being alive, I hope I'm not <laughs> kind of going to get into trouble now by revealing ages. Um, but, you know, he could be taken at ease. You know, I've done my bit. I've given everything in ministry. And, and you know, we were talking about uh, we were kind of bragging on him to some friends of ours this week because, you know, he, he said this to us. He said, you know, I've been a leader in a church, but I, I, I now want to be a good follower. I want to be a great follower. And, you know, that's the heart of a, a good manager when they recognize that ultimately, as, as we are all in this position, that ultimately we are here to lead others, but to be a great leader, we have to be a great follower, which means kind of doing what is right with what is given to us. You know, we've been talking a lot at Everyday Champions about the importance of conversations, of coaching conversations, that these are discipleship opportunities to impact and influence people. He goes out every single day, and he's often, every time we see him, he comes back and tells us about another conversation that he has had. He, he expects he, he invites, he asks for conversations. And guess what? When you ask for them, <laughs> you get them. And so some of us are like saying, well, I don't make an impact. I don't, I don't make a difference in people's lives. Well, are you asking for the conversations? Again, if you know my father-in-law, then go and speak to him. He'll encourage you with, with what he's seen as a result. But you know, it, when you are a good manager, God entrusts you with more. He'll give you more opportunities. He'll lead you into more um, places and spaces for you to occupy, to bring the kingdom of God, but you've got to be a good manager with what you've been given. I, I, let me encourage you, set a goal each day. This is 
it's so simple to do. Simple to do. Set a goal each day and just say, like, who do I want to have a conversation with today? How do I want to make them feel? What is it I want them to know? When you're praying in the morning, just say, God, this is what I want to do. I want to, I want to, to serve. I want to, I want to make an impact. I, I want somebody to feel something that I feel from you every day, God. I want them to feel love, joy, peace, hope. So listen, let's jump back to what Paul is saying here in 2 Corinthians 9. And this is what he goes on to say from verse 7. He says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Wow. You see, Paul is highlighting to us here that heart health can be measured. That ultimately what we do with what we material, materially have, what we do with our time, what we do with our energies, where we spend that, these are things that can be measured. Yeah, We can measure time, we can measure um, uh, where we put the best of our time and energies, especially when we know maybe in the certain points of the day and week we have the highest amount of energy. So what am I doing during those periods? And then, of course, what money I have. So these material things that we can we can measure them. But Paul here is saying that that okay, with this gift that you are preparing to the church at Corinth, I want it to be a gift that is done cheerfully. I want it to be done not under compulsion because you feel you have to. I want it to be because you want to. And again, he's saying. He's giving them a principle of the kingdom, that you are in a kingdom that does not lack. You are in a kingdom of abundance. He says, and God is able, God is able to bless you abundantly. So then in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. I love the absolute nature of that statement. I mean, how many times do we fear not having enough, not having what we need, not able to be generous, not able to do the good works that are connected to our mission. Well, God is saying, you don't have to fear any of that if you adopt the position of being a good manager that becomes a trustworthy manager. If you measure and prepare what you have in a way that is, in faith, going to serve God and serve people, if you are a good steward with what you have, then, then God is saying, I've taken care of the supply. God's job is the supply. Your job is stewarding the supply. So all I need to do is not focus on where is the supply coming from, but what am I doing with what has already been supplied? And, and I need to prepare. I need to measure. I need to be proactive, not reactive when it comes to the things that God has blessed me with. And of course, what happens is the mission focuses us because without a mission, we don't have a demand. We just think, well, life is about just maintaining a level of lifestyle. God forbid that that's what we fall into as the church, where we're just about, well, as long as I've got enough to live, then then great, we're all good. And I'll turn up to church and I'll give my glory to God. And and as long as God is blessing what I'm doing, then, then, then all is good. No, that is not kingdom living. Seeking first the kingdom is not getting God to seek first our interests. It's about us seeking first his interests and putting everything that we have behind his interest. And he promises when we seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, then all the other things will be added. He will supply. He will add when we are focused on what we are supplying. So again, that's why Paul's letters are often about the church supplying to the needs. The early church, which again, Leanne's doing a fabulous job in circles, which I, I believe we've come to a conclusion now, but uh, of looking at the early church. And they, they had an abundance uh, in, in the church because each person was measuring and preparing what they had, meeting the needs proactively, not reactively, cheerfully, not begrudgingly. Okay? So let, let me encourage you right now because, and I've said it already, but 
the what is important in the kingdom rarely feels urgent. The urgent in our lives is usually driven by feeling. Well, I feel I need to do this. And usually that can often be driven by fear. But we have to really take a hold of our lives. We need to take a hold of our marriages. We need to take a hold of our families. We need to take a hold of our finances. We need to take a hold of our health. We need to take a hold of our, our relationships. And we need to start measuring. Because if we don't, we will not become trustworthy because we're not good managers, because we're not measuring, okay? So the final point is this, and then we'll have a final point of, of interaction. A trustworthy manager will manage miracles. A trustworthy manager will manage miracles. So remember, ma measurement leads to good management. Good management leads to becoming a trustworthy manager. And a trustworthy manager means we will manage miracles. Paul says in verse 10 of 2 Corinthians 9, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. You see, that's the mission, isn't it? to be generous on every occasion, where we get excited and enthused about looking for opportunities to supply. And, and that's the kingdom, that we would be led by faith and not by sight, that we're led by this absolute awareness of the abundance and wealth of the kingdom of heaven, and that we are to, to access that and to use it to impact the earth. God wants to supply more. And he says here, Paul says, he supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. In other words, he will supply the bread that you are to eat and the seed that you are to sow. He'll increase the, the store of seed. In other words, as he sees you sowing it, as he sees you in line with your mission, giving out, he will give more. And it will result in thanksgiving to God. It will produce stories where we celebrate the goodness of God. You know, this week, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, me and Leanne drove a few hours to visit uh, some friends and we had a great time, spent some time talking, sharing, eating together for a few hours and, and sharing stories. And as we shared those stories, as I reflect upon that time together, it was, it was, a time when we were all refreshed because we were sharing stories of God's miracle working power. Stories when it, things just didn't add up naturally speaking. In other words, God came through in ways in, our, in families, in church, in finances, in relationships, in health, in ways that were just, they just don't, it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. But that's the kingdom economy. The kingdom economy is when we take what we have, and this is the, this, the principles here. I can look at every one of the stories that were shared, and those stories were, were the result of God's goodness and faithfulness connected with the measurement of being a good manager, of being trustworthy, and taking what we had in those situations that often doesn't seem enough. In fact, rarely ever seems enough. But that's the whole point because that's the, that's the area where we lack is the area where we trust God. Um, but we don't go in looking at driven by sight. Well, I lack, so I can't do this. No, I see the lack and I say, that's your area, God. I, I know I've got this, but you're going to come through and do that. When it's in alignment with his will and, and his mission, and we're doing it to delight him and to serve others, then every one of these stories was connected to being a good manager. And again, you know, there are times when we fail. There are times when we fall short. There are times when we're not measuring the right things. But I'm mean, here to, to, to rally the, 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 the people of God and to say it's time to understand the space that God wants you to occupy. There's a space that you are uniquely shaped to occupy. 
There are miracles. There are stories that God wants you to, to manage. He wants you to bring the riches of heaven to earth so that people are impacted with the wealth of heaven. And wealth is not just finance. The wealth includes finances, relationships. It requires, it, it in, includes uh, uh, the whole area of, of, of for be, feeling fulfilled and, and meaning and joy and peace of mind. All of these aspects are aspects of of the, the, the wealth of God's kingdom. And as with any kind of the kingdom concept, and we've seen this again, man's version of kingdom is, is flawed because man is flawed. So we have lots of examples of how kingdom has not been done correctly. But, the, but kingdoms have, have a wealth. And of course, in the, the United Kingdom, that kingdom has a, has, a, uh, has a number of other realms in which the, the queen and now, of course, the king uh, presides. And, of course, we have this thing called the Commonwealth. And the whole idea of the Commonwealth was that the wealth of the nation that colonized the nations that they took on was to share and distribute that wealth to those nations. Now, of course, again, it, there's lots of examples where that isn't uh, the case. But the whole idea is that that there's an abundance in the, in the kingdom of, of heaven, and God wants to bring that abundance to earth. He wants to colonize earth with his rule and his reign, not so that people are held back, but so that they are released in the fullness of who he's created them to be. He wants the, the, the wealth of the kingdom to become common wealth. In other words, that every day, in everything, you are able to abound in every good work. Why? Because there is a wealth that is not scarce. It is common. In other words, it's available all the time. But we have to be vessels that are ready to measure, as good managers do, to be good managers that become trustworthy and trustworthy so that we are able to then manage the miracle. And those stories that we shared, I went away and Leanne went away, uh, just inspired to believe bigger, to believe for more because God is wanting to fill this whole earth with the, the knowledge of, of, of Christ Jesus and his glory. But he's going to do that through you. and He's going to do that through me. And so here's the final, final interaction question. What does the mission require you to start measuring today? What does the mission, what does your mission require you to start measuring today? Now, you may say, well, I don't know my mission, Gareth. Well, let, let's start with the Great Commission that we are all called to. If we're followers of Christ, we're called to go into the world. In other words, that's the places and spaces that you go in each day and to make disciples. Let's bring that right down to having conversations. So, okay, we've, we've all got something we could talk about. So the mission is about conversations that ultimately are going to lead to, to Christ being revealed through our lives and and. And experienced by other people. So what does the mission require you and I to start measuring today? Discuss this and then we'll come back to land.
You know, the amazing thing about mission is that it focuses us. It brings real focus. It's the why behind what we do. Maybe you've lost the why. Maybe you've lost the why of, of, of why you're, you're together as church, whether you're meeting with a few believers in your home or in one of our rooms or whether you're meeting online. Maybe you've lost the why of, of why you do that. Maybe you've lost the why in your life, your career, your job. Maybe you've lost the why of being a parent or a husband or a wife or, or a friend. Listen, we need to keep strengthening pouring fuel onto the why because when we lose the why we lose the will we lose the will to do what good managers do and measure what is truly important so that we can be prepared to do good work so that we can prepare to be generous on every occasion so that we can be seen as ready to receive the supply that god wants us to supply listen I, I want to encourage you, I'm going to pray in the moment for every one of us, because I want us to go from this conversation today with a renewed sense of passion and determination to get our house in order, to get every area of our house in order, our finances, our health, our relationships. And, you know, it's not an overnight thing, but there is a next thing that you can do and then the next thing to do. And if you are part of every, Everyday Champions, then you are part of a church where we will constantly be talking about this and even more so as we come into this season of uh, uh, that is so significant for us as a church but here's the thing i'm going to be running a a session on monday the 24th so if you're watching this live that's tomorrow evening if you're watching this back then it may have happened but i'm going to make it so that you can watch it back so again we'll put a link on this YouTube. And I want you to think about if if you really want to be somebody who is going to make an impact, if you really want to get mission fit, if you can't say, do you know what, I know what my mission is and I know the 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 supply God wants me to bring and where he wants me to take it to, then the the session that I'm going to be running is called Occupy Your Space. Occupy your space. There's a space that you are uniquely designed to occupy. In other words, when I say occupy, it's to bring the kingdom of heaven into that place and space. Maybe right now that place and space is dark. Maybe it lacks the presence of God. Maybe it lacks the love, joy, peace, and hope that heaven holds. Well, do you know what? You are uniquely positioned to bring his will to earth to bring his influence into that space but he's not going to do it in spite of you he has to work through the structure and principles that he's put in place he only works through good managers and this isn't about iq this is not about you know competency in terms of how well you did at school <laughs> okay listen this is about a willingness to get serious with why God got serious with sending his son Jesus. Because he came to redeem that which was lost. That is you and everything that is in you. The, the potential to impact this earth for him. And he needs what is in you. He needs you. So join me for that session. And it's going to be a session where we're going to be online together. And you'll be able to interact with others and I'm going to take you through a very clear way of, of defining what your mission is. And I believe it can be a real catalyst to get you moving in, in becoming a great manager. You know, you, our children, as a father, my children need to see me as a good manager. My wife needs to see me as a good manager. My, my, my colleagues need to see me as a good manager. My, those that I interact with need to see that. The world needs good management, the management of the kingdom of God. So... Join me for that. But come on, I want to pray right now. I want to pray that we go away from today's conversation with a renewed sense of determination to, to become good managers so that we start to measure. We have the mindset of Christ and we have the mission of Christ and we understand what that looks like for us day in, day out. So come on, Father, we thank you you have called us. Thank you that you have predestined us. You equipped us with everything that we needed and you put it in us before you even started us. 
You made sure that we'd have everything that we would need already. Thank you, Father, that we do not lack. Whilst right now, factually speaking, there may be gaps, gaps in our health, gaps in our finances, gaps in our relationships. But Father, you want to close those gaps. You want to bring the abundance of heaven and you want to to close the gaps in our lives so that we can close the gaps in our society and bring love, joy, hope, and peace to a world that needs heaven to impact it. In all the areas of our society, business, education, family, health, uh, media, arts, entertainment, sport, government, Father God, we pray that you'll use us, your church, We right now offer up our lives as living sacrifices to be good managers and stewards. By your grace, help us. And may we encourage and spur one another on to love and good deeds that bring glory to you and create stories that inspire generations to come for your glory. Amen. Amen. Well, remember today and every day, you are a champion. And there's more in you than you think. Thank you for that conversation, Gareth. What a great message, a challenge to us. And I encourage you to take that conversation into your week. Spend some time going over your notes, praying uh, over some of those things that that stood out to you, your ABCs, the things that you became aware of. And, And maybe pick up a conversation with somebody this week around the topic of what has just been discussed with us today. Thank you, Gareth. That was absolutely brilliant. Well, we're going to carry on with our worship today as we take communion. So if you're watching at home and you need to go and grab some bread and juice so you can take that with us, feel free to go and do that now. And uh, I'm going to read to you a verse um, or a few verses from uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. And starting at verse 9, it says this. He has saved us and called us to a holy life not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of the time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Some really, really great verses there. That of, as we come around this, this time, as we worship God and we take the bread and we take the juice, we remember that we have not done anything. There was nothing that we have done that deserved reconnection back to God. Jesus came to this earth and reconnected us back to the Father. But it was nothing that we had done. Those verses say it's, it's not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. That word grace, if you think about the the letters that make up the word grace, G-R-A-C-E, I simply put it as God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ gave his life for you so that God could give you his riches. And we didn't deserve it, but that's what grace is, getting what we do not deserve. And we're just so thankful to him for that. And we can come and we can break the bread and we can say, Jesus, we thank you that you came and you gave your life so that I could experience reconnection back to the Father. I could experience God's grace and his mercy and his love. And we can take this remembering that he didn't stay in the grave. But he rose again and it said in those verses that he has destroyed death. 
that we don't have to be fearful of death. We don't have to be fearful of the future. We don't have to be fearful about what's going to happen because we know that Jesus, when he died on the cross, he destroyed death. And that means that we can take the bread and the juice today and remember what he has done. He's no longer in the grave, but he rose again and he's coming back again. And that's an amazing and an exciting uh, way and perspective to take the bread and juice today. That Jesus, you died, you destroyed death. And because of your death, because of what you did, I can experience the grace of God not because of anything that I have done to deserve it, but because purely because God loves me and God loves you today. And so as we take the bread and juice, let's have that as our mindset and our perspective today, that Jesus, you came and you gave yourself fully for us. So as I pray, let's take the bread and juice in worship to him. Lord God, we just thank you for your sacrifice of your son. Lord God, we thank you for your grace. We do not deserve your grace. There is nothing we could have done to deserve this. But you loved us so much that you sent your one and only son to die for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you gave yourself fully. We thank you that you went all the way to the cross. That even though in your humanity it was such a a painful and torturous moment, But you knew that you had to go through that and you said that you would follow the Father's will. And it was the Father's will for you to die so that we could have eternal life. And Lord Jesus, we are just so thankful. We thank you that you didn't stay in the grave, that you rose again, that you destroyed death and that we can have eternity with you in heaven. When we come to you and we say that we are sorry, today we say afresh, we are sorry for the things that we have done wrong. We are sorry for the things that we've done against you. And Lord Jesus, we accept your forgiveness and your love and your grace and your mercy and your kindness to us. We are just so overwhelmed by the gifts that you give us, the riches from God that were at your expense. So Lord God, we come to you today and we say thank you. Jesus, we thank you for your body that was broken and your blood that was shed. And we today give you the praise and the honour and the thanks. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for those who are given today, those people who are given financially today, who said, yes, I want to give out of the, uh, out of the overflow of what you have given us, from the provision of the things that you have given us. We give back to you today and we say thank you for what you have done for us and what you have given us. So we pray, Lord Jesus, that you will bless what is given today financially. Bring a multiplying effect to it, we pray, so that we can further your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's great to give as part of our worship. And if you want to give today, you can head over to our website, everydaychampions.tv slash give, where you can give directly as a one-off donation or as a regular give. You can do that all over on the website and the details are below. Well, it's been great to worship together. It's been great to uh, listen and grow and be disciples together. Remember, circles have finished for the summer, but you can meet up with your circle or with other people. Let's do the breaking of the bread together. Let's have meals together. Let's let's grow together, be disciples of Jesus together over this summertime. And we look forward to circles returning in September. Make sure you're subscribed to emails, as I said earlier, to make sure that you receive any information regarding that. Well, it's great to have you with us joined today. Remember today and every day, you are a champion and there is more in you than you think.